love that you're having an awesome day today. I can't wait to see all the exciting things that you've been doing and I can't wait to look on our class blog. Maybe you've uploaded some pictures or some videos. I can't wait to see it all. I am back with our book, Little House in the Big Wood, and I'm ready to read the next chapter. So get cozy, get a snack. Um, maybe invite your brothers and sisters or your dogs and cats to listen. Um, Memphis is around here somewhere. He may join us in the next chapter. Let's check it out. Winter days. Oh, there he is now. Winter days and winter nights. The first snow came and the bitter cold. Every morning, Pa took his gun and his traps and was gone all day in the big wood, setting the small traps for muskrats and minks along the creeks and middle-sized traps for foxes and wolves in the woods. He set out the bear traps, hoping to get a big fat bear before they all went into their dens for, din for winter. One morning he came back, took the horses and sled, and hurried away. He had shot a bear. Laura and Mary jumped up and down and clapped their hands, and they were so glad. Mary shouted, I want the drumstick! I want the drumstick! Mary did not know how big a bear's drumstick is. When Pa came back, he had both a bear and a pig in the wagon. He had been going through the woods with a big bear trap in his hands and the gun on his shoulder when he walked around a big pine tree covered with snow and the bear was behind the tree. The bear had just killed the pig and was picking it up to eat it and Pa said the bear was standing up on his hind legs holding the pig in his paws just as they were as though they were hands. Pa shot the bear and there was no way of knowing where the pig came from nor whose pig it was. So. I just brought home the bacon, Pa said. There was plenty of fresh meat to last for a long time. The days and the nights were so cold and the pork in a box and the bear meat hanging in the little shed outside the back door were solidly frozen and did not thaw. When Ma wanted fresh meat for dinner, Pa took the ax and cut off a chunk of frozen bear meat or pork. But the sausage balls or the salt pork or the smoked hams and the venison. Ma could get for herself from the shed or the attic. The snow kept coming until it was drifted and banked against the house. In the morning, the window panes were covered with frost in beautiful pictures of trees and flowers and fairies. Ma said that Jack Frost came in at the night and made the pictures while everyone was asleep. Laura thought that Jack Frost was a little man, all snowy white, wearing a glittering white pointed cap and soft white knee boots made of deer skin. His coat was white and his mittens were white and he did not carry a gun on his back, but his hands had shining, sharp tools which he carved the pictures. Laura and Mary were allowed to take Ma's thimble and make pretty patterns of circles in the frost on the glass, but they never spoiled the pictures that Jack Frost had made that night. When they blew their mouths so close to the pane and blew their breath on it, the white they put their mouths close to the pane and blew their breath on it. The white and frosted, the white frost melted and ran in drops down the glass. Then they could see the drifts of snow outdoors and the great trees standing bare and black, making thin blue shadows on the white snow. Laura and Mary helped Ma with the work. Every morning there were dishes to wipe. Mary wiped more of them than Laura because she was bigger. But Laura always wiped carefully her own little cup and plate. By the time the dishes were all wiped and set away, the trundle bed was aired. Then standing on one side each, Laura and Mary straightened the covers, tucked them in well at the foot and the sides, plumped up the pillows and pushed them into place. Then Ma pushed the trundle back into its place under the big bed. After this was done, Ma began work that belonged to the day. Each day had its own proper work. Ma used to say, wash on Monday, iron on Tuesday, mend on Wednesday, churn on Thursday, clean on Friday, bake on Saturday, rest on Sunday. Laura liked the churning and the baking days best of all of the week. <clears throat> in, the, in winter, the cream was not yellow as it was in the summer. The butter churned from it was white and not so pretty. Ma liked everything on her table to be pretty. So the winter time, she colored the butter. After she had put the cream in the tall crockery churn and set it near the stove to warm, she washed and scraped a long orange colored carrot. Then she grated it into the bottom of the old leaky tin pan that Pa had punched full of nail holes for her. Ma rubbed the carrot across the roughness until she had rubbed through the holes 
When she lifted the pan, there was a soft, juicy mound of grated carrot. She put this in a little pan of milk in the stove, and when the milk was hot, she poured the milk and carrot into a cloth bag. Then she squeezed the bright yellow milk into the churn, where it colored all the cream. Now the butter would be yellow. So clever. Laura and Mary were allowed to eat the carrot after the milk had been squeezed out. Mary thought she ought to have the larger share because she was older. And Laura said she should have it because she was littler. But Ma said they must divide it evenly. It was very good. When the cream was ready, Ma scalded a long wooden churn dash, put it in the churn, and dropped the wooden churn over, over it. The churn cover, excuse me, dropped the wooden churn cover over it. The churn cover had a little round hole in the middle, and Ma moved the dash up and down, up and down through the hole. She churned for a long time. Mary could sometimes churn while Ma rested, but the dash was far too heavy for Laura. So here's a picture of the what they're churning the butter in. That gives you an idea to kind of picture that in your head. At first, the splashes of cream showed thick and smooth around the little hole. After a long time, they began to look grainy. Then Ma churned more slowly, and on the dash, there began to appear tiny grains of yellow butter. When Ma took off the churn cover, there was butter in a golden lump, drowning in the buttermilk. Then Ma took out the lump with a wooden paddle into a wooden bowl, and she washed it many times in cold water, turning it over and over, working it with the paddle until the water ran clear. After that, she salted it. Now came the best part of the churning. Ma molded the butter. On the loose bottom of the wooden butter mold, she carved the picture of a strawberry with two strawberry leaves. With the paddle, Ma packed butter tightly into the mold until it was full. Then she turned it upside down over a plate and pushed on the handle of the loose bottom. The little firm pad of golden butter came out with the strawberry and its leaves molded on top. Laura and Mary watched breathless, one on each side of Ma, while well, the golden little butter pads, each with a strawberry on the top, dropped onto the plate. As Ma put all the butter through the mold, then Ma gave them each a drink of fresh buttermilk. On Saturdays, when Ma made the bread, they each had a little piece of dough to make into a little loaf. They might have to cook a bit of cookie dough, too, to make little cookies, and once Laura even made a pie in her patty pan. After the day's work was done, Ma sometimes cut paper dolls for them. She cut the dolls out of stiff white paper and drew the faces with a pencil. Then, from bits of colored paper, she cut dresses and hats, ribbons and laces, so that Laura and Mary could dress their dolls beautifully. But the best time of all was night, when Pa came home. He could come in from his trapping, through, excuse me, tramping through the snowy woods with tiny icicles hanging on the ends of his mustache. He would hang his gun on the wall over the door, throw off his fur cap and coat and mittens, and call, Where's my little half pint? Where sweet cider half drunk up? No, no, that's not right. Where's my little half pint of sweet cider half drunk up? That was Laura, because she was so small. Laura and Mary would run to climb on his knees and sit there while he warmed himself by the fire. Then he would put his coat and cap and mittens again and go out to do the chores and bring in plenty of wood for the fire. Sometimes when Pa had walked his trap lines quickly because the traps were empty or he got some game sooner than usual, he would come home early. Then he would have plenty of time to play with Laura and Mary. One game they loved was called Mad Dog. Pa was run his fingers through his thick brown hair, standing it all up on end. Then he dropped on all fours, growling, and chased Laura and Mary all through the room, trying to get them cornered while they couldn't get away. There... Uh, they were quick at dodging and running, but once he caught them against the wooden box behind the stove, they couldn't get past Pa. There was no other way out. Then Pa growled so terribly, his hair was so wild and his eyes so fierce that it all seemed real. Mary was so frightened that she could not move, but as Pa came near, Laura screamed. And with a wild leap and a scramble, she went over to the wood box, dragging Mary with her. And at once, there was no mad dog at all. There was only Pa standing there with his blue eyes shining, looking at Laura. Well, he said to her, you're only a little half pint of cider half drum up by jinx. You're as strong as a little French house. You shouldn't frighten the children so, Charles, Ma said. Look at how big their eyes are. 
Pa looked, and he took down his fiddle, and he began to play. Yankee Doodle went to town, he swore his striped trousies. He swore he couldn't see the town, there were so many houses. Laura and Mary forgot all about the mad dog. Um, there he saw some great big guns, big as a log of maple, and every time they turned them round, it took, it took two yoke of cattle. And every time they fired them off, it took a horn of powder. It made a noise like father's gun, only a nation louder. <laughs> that was kind of hard, because I don't know those words. But here's a picture of Pa playing with the girls getting scared. Pa was keeping time with his foot, and Laura clapped her hands to the music when he sang. I sing... Yankee Doodle, and I sing Yankee Doodle, and I sing Yankee Doodle, and I sing Yankee Doodle. All alone in the big wood, and the snow, and the cold, and the little house was warm and snug and cozy. Ma and Mary, and Pa and Laura, and Baby Carrie were comfortable and happy there, especially at night. Then the fire was shining on the hearth. The cold and dark and wild beasts were all shut out. And Jack the Brindle Bulldog and Black Susan the Cat lay blinking at the flames in the fireplace. Ma sat in her rocking chair, sewing by the light of the lamp on the table. The lamp was so bright and shiny, there was salt in the bottom of a glass bowl with the kerosene. To keep the kerosene from exploding, there were bits of red flame among the salt to make it pretty. It was pretty. Laura loved to look at the lamp with its glass chimney so clean and sparkling, its yellow flame burning so steadily, and its bowl of clear kerosene colored red by the bits of flannel. She loved to look at the fire in the fireplace, flickering and changing all the time, burning yellow and red and sometimes green above the logs and hovering blue over the golden and ruby coals. And then Pa told stories. When Laura and Mary begged him for a story, he would take them on his knees and tickle their faces with his long whiskers until they laughed aloud. His eyes were blue and merry. One night, Pa took, excuse me, looked at Black Susan, stretching herself out before the fire and running her claws out and in, and he said, Do you know that a panther is a cat? A great, big, wild cat. No, said Laura. Well, it is said Pa. Just imagine, Black Susan bigger than Jack and fiercer than Jack when he growls. Then she would be just like a panther. He settled Laura and Mary more comfortably on his knees and he said, I'll tell you about Grandpa and the panther. Your Grandpa? Laura asked. No, Laura. Your Grandpa. My father. Oh, Laura said, and she wriggled closer against Pa's arm. She knew her Grandpa. He lived far away in the big woods in a big log house. Pa began. The story of Grandpa and the Panther. Your Grandpa went to town one day and was late starting home. It was dark when he came riding his horse through the big wood, so dark that he could hardly see the road. And when he heard a panther scream, he was frightened, for he had no gun. How does a panther scream? Laura asked. Like a woman, said Pa, like this. Then he screamed so that Laura and Mary shivered with terror. Ma jumped out of her chair and said, Mercy, Charles! But Laura and Mary loved to be scared like that. The horse, with Grandpa on him, ran fast, for it was frightened too. But it could not get away from the panther. The panther followed through the dark woods. It was a hungry panther, and it came fast as a horse could run. It screamed now on the side of the road, now on the other side, and it was always close behind. Grandpa leaned forward in the saddle and urged the horse to run faster. The horse was running as fast as it possibly could run, and still the panther screamed close behind. Then Grandpa caught a glimpse of it as it le leapt from treetop to treetop, almost overhead. It was a huge black panther, leaping through the air like Black Susan leapt leaping on a mouse. It was many, many times bigger than Black Susan. It was so big that if it leapt onto Grandpa, it could kill him with his enormous slashing claws and its long, sharp teeth. Grandpa, on his horse, 
was running away from it just as a mouse runs from a cat. The panther did not scream anymore. Grandpa did not see it anymore. But he knew it was coming, leaping after him in the dark wood behind him. The horse ran with all its might. At last, the horse ran up to Grandpa's house. Grandpa saw the panther springing. Grandpa jumped off the horse against the door. He burst through the door and slammed it behind him. The panther landed on the horse's back, just where Grandpa had been. The horse was screaming terribly and ran. He was running away into the big wood with the panther riding his back and ripping his back with his claws. But Grandpa grabbed his gun from the wall. He got to the window just in time to shoot the panther dead. Grandpa said he would never again go into the big woods without his gun. When Pa told this story, Laura and Mary shivered and snuggled closer to him. They were safe and snug on his knees and with his strong arms around them. They liked to be there, before the warm fire with Black Susan purring on the hearth and good dog Jack stretched out beside her. When they heard a wolf howl, Jack's head lifted and the hairs rose stiff along his back. But Laura and Mary listened to the lonely sound in the dark and the cold of the big woods, and they were not afraid. They were cozy and comfortable in their little house made of logs. With the snow drifted around it, and the wind crying because it could not get in by the fire. And that's the end of that chapter. I hope that you enjoyed that. And, oops, gotta get my little bookmark in there. I hope you enjoyed that, and I can't wait to see you tomorrow.